because Samson uh, didn't keep, you know, to his vow. He didn't do it. He he killed many of the Philistines, but he he didn't overthrow the entire group. We see the same thing with Adam and his family. God told him to rule over creation, and he delegated to man even the responsibility to name all the animals. Uh, when it came time to free the Hebrews, remember God uh, rescued uh, Moses from death by putting, having his mother put him in a wicker basket and lined it with tar. And uh, we see that even though at the beginning he was fumbling and stumbling and uh, reluctant to do his calling, we see at the end he became humble and faithful uh, as being a leader over Israel. In another sense, though, we can say that God intervened in a way we don't typically expect, nor do we really want, and that is God withheld the joy of children from a couple. And we see that he uh, began by introducing the husband, Elkanah, uh, who was an unknown Ephraimite from the uh, tribe of Ephraim, and he had two wives, and that's, that's his problem right there. Uh, it was not according to God's law. It wasn't what God wanted, but remember during the period of the judges, everybody did what was right in their own sight. But we see here that uh, he had Hannah first and then Peniah uh, secondly. Hannah was childless, but Peniah had uh, at least two sons because it just says plural sons, and then she had a daughter. And then we see that... Uh, Twice God shows his activity in the life of this couple because it says twice in verses 5 and 6, the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving or had closed her womb. And so God has taken responsibility here for her not being able to have children. Now, the ability to open and close a, a womb belongs to the Lord. I mean, it's up to him. And so we have to acknowledge this reality and faith and trust that the fruit of childbearing is due to the wisdom and, and to the sovereignty of a good God. Now, ultimately, we're to live for God's glory and for our good. And so therefore, when things don't go the way we want them, once again, as I, even I prayed earlier, we've got to remember God is a good God. And he does all things well. And so when we don't get the answers that we desire, God has a different purpose for it. Here it was so that she would be humbled and Hannah would come to him in prayer and ask him for this child. And then in order, once he blessed her, that she would receive this child and then she would devote him to the Lord. And this is what God needed in the last judge. Uh, that was someone who was completely devoted to him, unlike Samson, who didn't keep any of the <laughs> Nazarite laws uh, that he was told that he and his mother both were, were to keep. In fact, he just played with them, you know, and we saw that when he started talking about his hair. Uh, and that's why he never really overcame the Philistines. Well, God wanted the man because he's going to do something new here. God was going to bring in a kingship in Israel. Now this really wasn't God's preferred will <clears throat> because he says to them later on, I'm your king. And they kept saying, well, we want to be like all the other nations. You know, it's kind of like when I was a kid, you know, and all the other kids had a certain brand of jeans, you know, and so you go home and you tell your mom, well, yeah, I've got to have Wrangler because that's what all the guys wear. You know, this is the way uh, the Israelites were. Well, all the other nations have got a king, and he leads them in their army. Now, God was leading them in the Ark of the Covenant. They were putting the Ark of the Covenant out in front whenever they went into battle, and they always won, uh, unless they had sin in their lives. So anyway, God wanted Hannah to devote Samuel to him, and this is what we're going to see here in a moment. Now, notice that uh, her husband lo excuse me, loved Hannah. The Bible says uh, ultimately what that means, he loved her more than he loved his other wife. 
And we see at their annual sacrifices, uh, he would give her, we're told, a double portion of the meat as a way of showing her his favoring her, I guess you would say, over tonight. And this caused jealousy because I'm sure he showed in other ways that he preferred Hannah over uh, Peniel. Well, this made her, her angry, it made her jealous, and so she began to deride uh, Hannah and began to make fun of her for her barrenness and say <coughs> things like, look how God has blessed me. You know, I've got sons and daughters for my husband, and what have you given to him? You haven't given him anything. And the way that it talks about it is that she didn't do this just once, but she did it repeatedly over and over and over again until the place where it says that Hannah, you know, would lose heart. She's about to give up. And that takes us to verses, uh, the last section that uh, Dennis read for us, verses 11 through 19. So one day when she had enough of Naya's uh, attacks, we see that uh, she didn't uh, respond, uh, didn't try to protect herself, didn't try to tell her she was wrong or anything else. Instead, we see that she went to the Lord, verses 7 through 10. Now, this is what she should have done first. This is what we all should have done first, and that is uh, go to the Lord first and format. There's some books over here. Okay. Left mine in his car. <laughs> and so we see here that uh, at the temple dwelling in Shiloh, uh, they made their sacrifices and she prayed in her anguish and made a vow to God that the Lord would take notice of her, uh, her situation, her affliction, and if he would uh, give her a son, that she would in turn give him to the Lord, quote unquote. Now, what she's talking about is the dedication of him to the Lord. Now, it wasn't just saying, I'm going to set him aside for God's purposes like Samuel was. No, she literally means she was going to give him uh, to the Lord. And we'll see that a little bit later. And notice the promised sign of this dedication to the Lord, which she never cut the child's hair. Uh, again, like Samuel. Samuel. Now, he was not a Nazarite, and so he didn't have the other restrictions, such as, you know, he uh, couldn't touch wine uh, or grapes or, you know, uh, but any Israelite was not supposed to touch a dead animal. So uh, notice his, her sign was that she would never cut his hair. So we see Hannah was begging God for a son and promising to raise him for God's purpose alone. Now notice in her deep and her silent prayer, she had uh, many tears, and it led Eli, the priest, to look at her, and he thought she was drunk because uh, her eyes were closed, her lips were moving, but nothing was coming out. And so he thought, oh, another drunk. <laughs> you know, I got somebody coming into the Lord's house, you know, coming in here, acting like they're the Lord's person, and yet they're drunk. And so he couldn't help himself. He was indignant. And evidently, as soon as she was done, he said to her, give up your drink. You know, quit getting drunk. You know, that's not what you need. You need to have more of the Lord, not more of his wine. And she told him, oh, you know, I never did. I'm not drunk. I haven't tasted, you know, wine nor beer. I haven't, uh, I'm not inhibited in any way. It's just that in my distress, I was praying so fervently to God. Uh, and I didn't even realize my lips were moving. You know, don't think of me as an evil woman because I need God's blessing. You've got to understand, I'm, I'm doing this in all sincerity. I'm doing it because I love God and I'm trusting God and I'm hoping he's going to answer my prayer. Well, once she said that to Eli, Eli asked that God would bless her and that he would bless her prayer and she would get the answer. Uh, that she was asking for, which was a son. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, how many times, you know, do we find ourselves begging for God's help? We're in deep pain, you know, for whatever reason. And uh, we see that Hannah modeled the appropriate approach in these times rather than fret and worry and 
uh, trivial things, we should request uh, to God and ask Him to answer the prayer uh, in the way that He sees best. But like Hannah, we should pray for God's purpose in the world. You know, too often we think of prayer as God being a divine genie who's there just to give us the answers to our request. I used to always, in my sermons, say we think that God's kind of like one of those food dispensers. You know, you drop in your money and you hit A7, and you pull the handle and you think it's just going to drop down and you're going to get, you know, what you paid for. You might pull a handle, you mean push a button, don't you? Oh, you pull oh pull you're old, I forgot. <laughs> pull the handle was the old way to do it. Actually, pull the handle was a cigarette machine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was telling you. Okay. <laughs> Pull the hand to push the button. <laughs> you deserve that, Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. We sure that you do, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we, we pray for God's purpose. And that is, you know, we want God to give good gifts to his children. And we know that he promises that he will when it's in the line with his will. And that's what First John tells us. You know, we can ask anything if it's according to God's will and he will grant it. But we forget sometimes to realize that what we ask for has to be according to his will. And this is why we fail. Well, notice Hannah, after her prayer and her many tears, we see that she went back home. Uh, she did eat. She had been refusing to eat before, and she ate the meat. And uh, after she ate, we see that uh, the Bible tells us in verse 17 and 18 that she began now to walk in peace. And that is, she had a peace about herself. She had turned it over to God finally. Instead of worrying about it, and fretting about it, and having all this anxiety, she finally released it by turning it over to God. <coughs> Okay, question or comments? Doug, just one comment, and that's uh, the whole idea that there were polygamy in that society. Uh, the, one of the authors points out here that that was not uncommon. It wasn't God's plan. But if you go back to uh, Abram with Hagar, essentially a wife, and Sarah, and then you pick up Jacob, Leah and Rachel. I mean, this was not uncommon within the patriarchs, but also not uncommon in that society. Uh, but what it often led to, as the authors point out, is some strife within the family. Uh, we see that with Abram, with Jacob, and, and uh, now with uh, Elkanah. But, and Samuel really is sometimes considered the 13th judge. There's, I think, 12 judges in there, and then he's considered the 13th, I think, if I remember right. Is that why 13 is unlucky? I guess it must be. <laughs> I don't know if Samuel is unlucky or not, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Good point. Okay. All right, let's move over now to verses 19 and 20 and verses 20 through 28. Someone want to read those for us? Yeah, I can. Okay. Then they got up early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah and his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him, asked for him of the Lord. Okay, verse 24 through 28. <coughs> now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull, one ephah of flour, and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. And she said, Pardon me, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord. I am the woman who stood here before you, praying to the Lord. For this boy I have prayed, and the Lord has granted me my request, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Okay, notice, after setting up the bad that we had in the last passage, we see now it comes to the good that Hannah's pregnancy uh, that God granted and opened her womb and the birth of her long-awaited son. 
Now, notice the author of 1 Samuel uses the word remembered to describe God's grace to Hannah. And in our modern thinking, that, that would mean that somehow he forgot her. You know, but that's not what it really means. It's not the case. The same idea is communicated in Exodus 2.24 where it says he, God remembered his covenant with the nation of Israel when they were in slavery. And so it's not talking about God forgetting and then God remembering. What it's talking about is that God's remembering is a function of his per perfect timing, not a human tendency to forget. So in other words, God says now is the time to deliver them out of slavery. Now's the time to open Hannah's womb. So it's, it's not that he literally forgot because God can't forget anything. Uh, someone will say, yeah, but what about it says he forgets our sins? Well, God doesn't forget our sins. It's that God chooses not to bring them up again. And that's the difference. God can't forget anything. God's God. If he could ever fail to do anything, he would cease to be God. And so, like God, when it says we're to forgive other people, it doesn't mean we're going to forgive, for, forget the harm that they have done us. And some of it, you know, may be abusive or whatever, but if they're to really repent, we are to not bring it up again, not to them and not to ourselves. And so this is what it's talking about when it says God remembered, and that was, it, it was now time for God to act. It was time for him now to give her the son that she had asked for. And just as God had been active in closing her womb, notice God is now active in opening it. And so we see Hannah and the company of a lot of women in the Old Testament, like Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, who were once barren, but who miraculously gave birth to children. But notice these children were all special. They were all instrumental in the work of God. That each one of these who had their wounds closed, that God did it for a purpose so that they would ask him, and these children would be raised to his uh, glory and then he would use them in great ways. Now Samuel uh, was to be God's agent to care for his people, a bridge between the really degeneration uh, of uh, the judges, who some of them were righteous, and some of them were unrighteous like Samuel. Uh, some were good, some were bad. Some, uh, the people followed them, notice once they sinned, they cry out to God, and then God would send a judge. And as long as that God, that judge lived, the people would follow God. But as soon as he died, they go right back to adultery or idolatry again. And so what we see here is this circular thing that happened among the people of Israel, that God would send them, you know, he would allow them to go into sin, he would punish them, they would cry out to God. God would send a deliverer. And then as long as the deliverer lived, they would follow God. But then the next generation would fall right back in idolatry again. So Samuel was going to be instrumental because right after Samuel comes, who comes after Samuel? Kings. Yeah, Saul. King Saul. Yeah. And so Samuel's going to be the last judge. And so he had to have a make a good foundation so that after the judges they would fall into having righteous kings. Uh, Which didn't work out so well either. Yeah, it didn't work out. Well. <laughs> you brought up such a good point um, in your uh, message uh, here. Um, and it's, it's a good way for me to think of this. You know, uh, God uh, would not be God if he didn't make the decisions that he has to make, what he sees to be for the overall good of, of mankind. Um, uh, for this baby to be conceived, it was God's doing. And uh, if, if he didn't have involvement in it, uh, he would, you know, he would not be the God that he is. Uh, uh, like you said, uh, God would cease to be God type of thing. I think that's important. 
Yeah, it is important. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I hear you, Barry. Yeah, that's good, Jim. Uh, yeah, a prime example in my mind of this is uh, the law just didn't work. The law just didn't work. You can hire one judge to the next judge, but if that's all you're going with and Christ is in the middle of being the judge, the law with men, it just doesn't work. Right. Well, that's the whole purpose right. of the law. Now, remember that all the law could do is reveal sin. And that's what Paul says later on. And then, that's why you yes. need grace after the law, because, you know, the Holy Spirit points us on to Christ. Look, guys, my phone is about ready to die. Randy, I'm going to have to have you. You're going to have to dial back in. I just now noticed that I'm on, you know, just a few percentage. So, Randy's going to call in. And so I'm going to hang you up, but call right back, okay? I got a cord. All right, oh. okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on a second, guys. Hold on. We, we think we have a cord. <laughs> guys still with us? Yeah, Barry, are you there? Yep. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. Then you have to let long enough. Um, on the other side, no. I think. No. Yeah. Is it going to be long enough? Long this side This makes for a good video. It does. You may have to stop. Yeah. 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 Hey, you're going to come here. 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 Is coming to the speaker. The phone doesn't have to be up. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Good. Cool. Okay. So we still have Barry and Jim on the phone, right? Emergency alert. Yeah, we're we're hanging in there. Hey, all good. Right. <laughs> all right. Yeah, if you want to watch the video, you can see all this excitement happening. Right? <laughs> 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 answer the call. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but I was afraid we're about to lose you and uh, didn't want to do that. So anyway, let's try and get back where we were at. Uh, notice that Hannah, when she prayed to God, she had prayed many prayers and she was blessed by God. And so as we said, she's kind of the model for us of how to pray. You know, James tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And we need to be praying people uh, for God to remember us and to act on our behalf. And remember, when it says for God to remember, it's not meaning that he's forgotten us, but it means that, you know, act in his own time. And I know if some of you are like me, you've been praying for certain things for years and have not yet seen any results. But remember, it's not in our time, but in God's timing that he'll answer his prayers. And he has a purpose for everything. And so we just need to be continuously bringing our prayers before God. And God is faithful to work through our prayers. Uh, you know, this is what the Bible uh, teaches us. Now let's go on to verses we 20. Need to be, in, other words, in other words, you're saying we need to be tireless in our prayer pursuits. Yes, Jim, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, we, we need to never give up. Uh, that's right. Amen. Can, yeah, I wish I could remember names better than what I can, but there was this uh, Christian man, Pastor Mueller. George Mueller had prayed for his neighbor for 61 years, and then Char George Mueller died. Ooh. And at his grave site, his brother was standing there with that neighbor. And the neighbor says, you know, George really loved me. And his brother said, yes, he did. And he said, you know what? If George loved me that much, his God must be real. And so at his grave site, his brother led this man to the Lord. Now that's what it means to tireless, you know, be tireless in our praying that he prayed for 61 years and didn't even get to see the result of it, but the result happened. But again, it was in God's timing. 
And that's why we need to never give up. Great example. Mm, thank you. Now notice, having received what she had asked for, Hannah was true to her promise and she gave her son uh, back to the Lord for his service. Verse 11. Now notice, uh, she took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh and there she reminded Eli of the first meme she gave the report that the Lord had indeed uh, granted her request. Now this is some years later. Now it's not like it happened the next year because we were told before that she waited until she had weaned the child. Now the book suggests it's probably age two or three. But my dad told me that he was born in 22, 1922, and he had uh, five siblings after him. And he said that his mother, because of the depression and 30 and, and whatever, that she breastfed all of her children until they went to school because they didn't have milk. They couldn't get it. I mean, you know, they just couldn't afford it. And so, he said all the younger children were breastfed until they went to school. So we're talking maybe five years old. Uh, you know, what about the time before this pasteurization and, uh, you know, all these other things that we have so conveniently now, you know, all these, there's a shortage and it's really a terrible shortage of baby food because these children, that's where they get their nutrients. Well, what did they do before there was baby food? The mother breastfed them, and she breastfed them probably as long as she could for them to get all the nutrients. And so while they say that she took him at two or three, I think more likely she took him around five uh, because I wouldn't want a two-year-old running around the temple you know, <laughs> going yeah. berserk, three to five. You know, buying, you know, bothering all the people who are trying to worship God. So whatever age he was, anyway, she brought him and she presented him to Eli. And she reminded him of the time that he thought she was drunk and all the other things that had happened. And she told him how she had told the Lord that if he gave her a son, and now she was presenting to Eli to raise because this is what she had promised God she was going to do. Now it's interesting, however long she had him, she put something in that child that Eli's own sons didn't have because his sons ended up being unrighteous. They would steal portions of the meat and the sacrifices and uh, a lot of other things. So God finally killed them when he got enough of them. But Samuel grew up to be, you know, a person of God. And so in that, however long she had him, she must have instilled more into him than what Eli was able to get to his own sons in their entire lifetime. Well, I think she had a timeline. So when you have a deadline, you do more. Right. And she had a deadline, and she knew it. She knew it from day one. She had a deadline, so she had to take all she could and put in him before she before she gave him away. Now we see also. Uh, that she said, I'll give him to the Lord as long as he lived. And there's a certain formality uh, in the way in the Old Testament that you fulfilled a vow. The attendant had uh, to worship God through sacrifice that would be pleasing aroma to the Lord. And in fact, we see that Hannah was an example of praying in the Lord, also an example of worship of the Lord. And so this was an act of worship where she was sacrificing the ability to keep her son and gave him, not as the heathen did where they sacrificed their children fire, but she gave him to <clears throat> Eli to raise in the presence of the Lord. Now notice we're told that every year Hannah went with her husband uh, to worship and to make the prescribed sacrifices. That was back in chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. After her prayer, Hannah got up early in the morning to worship the Lord. Before she even received, we're told, uh, the Lord's answer. We see then uh, she entrusted Samuel to Eli's care. 
and she clearly attributed the blessing of a son in her life to the Lord's work. And finally, Hannah's son followed the example of his parents and worshiped the Lord in the temple, chapter 1, verse 28. <clears throat> so we see that she gave him to the Lord, and so therefore she only came and saw him once a year. He was the Lord's. He was no longer her son. And so she couldn't make weekly or monthly trips to see him and check on him. And her. No, he was the Lord's. But she would come once a year and she would give him another, we're told, coat or jacket uh, because he was growing. And so he would outgrow it year by year. And so, and remember, she probably made it by hand. It might have taken her all year to do it. But this is her way of getting to see him when it came to worship the Lord. And she could present him with this and she could remind him on a yearly basis how God had answered her prayer and while she had given him to Eli to raise. You know, I find it interesting, Doug, at, uh, in verse 24, uh, where she, you, you mentioned that she came to worship. Well, she brought, uh, when she brought the, her son Samuel, she also brought a three-year-old bull, uh, half a bushel of flour, a clay jar of wine, which would have been, from the Old Testament, the law, mm -hmm. would have been those things that would be expected. But notice the elements there. Uh, the bull, would have been slaughtered, that, therefore you have the blood. The flour would have been the bread. And of course the wine in the New Testament is also symbolic of the blood of Christ. But you have those elements that in the Old Testament that point forward sure. to uh, the, the subsequent um, death of Christ with the shedding of the blood, the shedding of the body, the whole body. And, and then of course the wine, the flour representing the bread, and then of course the wine representing blood in the New Testament. But those are all elements that we see not only in the Old Testament, we see them in the New Testament as well. Yeah, Paul tells us in First Corinthians 10. Great, uh, great uh, comment there uh, as far as this section being so symbolic. I mean, it's uh, you brought that up, Kevin, and uh, that was important to do so. Yeah. Uh, Paul tells us in the New Testament that all these things happened in the Old Testament were shadows and types, and they were to lead to the New Testament, the New Covenant. Uh, okay, good. Uh, notice that uh, we too, like Hannah, uh, are going to have times that are good and bad, but we should have a life marked by worship at all times and all circumstances and all type of life that uh, God will give to us. We're called to a whole life worship, offering all we have and all that we are for the Lord's purposes. And notice that we're told in uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that it's our spiritual service to give not only our bodies but ourselves to the Lord, to know Him, to love Him, and to obey Him because of who he is and what he has done, as Randy just told us, by giving his own son to die on the cross for our sins. Okay, let's move on to our third point, if there are no questions or comments. And then this is a short passage, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 6. Somebody want to read? Maybe I can hear I can that. read. Okay, Jim. Then Hannah prayed, and yet yeah, Hannah prayed and said, "My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance." Uh, now, which one? Uh, verse six. Which? Uh, Just verse, verse six. six. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. Okay, thank you, Jim. Now notice verses 1 and 2. It seems that Hannah's act of dedication meant leaving her son while she returned home, as we just said, would take faith and dedication. She had desired children for years and finally got an answer of prayer, and then she gave him back to the Lord under the care of the priest, and she would only see him once a year. And 
the teacher's book says we need to ask a question. What would cause someone to take such a drastic step? And so the answer is really in four courts here. And first of all, we see the prayer of praise that Hannah made to the Lord. It's kind of like the Mary's praise when she found that God was going to use her to be the mother of the Savior of the world. And in this, we see that Hannah was not merely <coughs> joyful at the fact that God had provided her son, because that would mean that she valued the gift over the giver. You know, if God had given her her Samuel and she renounced her vow and says, oh, I can't give him up, then what she would be saying is, God, I care more about the child than I do you. And so, no, she had to keep the vow because she prized God. She found joy in God himself, the giver. And we see that he had the power in the heart to give good gifts to his children in his own timing. That's what it means, again, when it says he remembered her. Second of all, we see that she praised the Lord as the one who lifted up her horn. Now, this is meaning like an animal that has horns, like a steer or an ox, and it adorns the animal's head. And a person could lift up his or her horn, if you want, in arrogance or rebellion, if they wanted to. In other words, it could be a prideful act, or a person's horn could be exalted by the strength of the Lord. And David talks about this in the Psalms, that God had lifted his horn. And it's just the old Jewish way of saying that God had lifted me up. He had blessed me. He had given me more than I was even able to ask or think about. And that's what he's going to do for us when we get to heaven. You know, because the Bible says, I have not seen, ears not heard, and we can't even enter into our hearts the things God has prepared for those who love him. So it's going to be greater than that. And this was what Hannah was saying here. He's lifted me up. He's blessed me. No longer could Peniah, uh her, you know, alter, you know, I don't want to call her evil. <laughs> Maybe she wasn't really evil. Maybe she was just jealous. But the other wife, you know, she couldn't say anything to her because now she had a child. Now she could say to her, yeah, you've got three or four kids, but my child is serving the Lord in the temple. You know, what greater to have a bunch of kids that do nothing or one child who does a lot? And so we see here that uh, she's able to now to have her horn lifted. And that's what it's talking about here, that God had blessed her, even in difficult things. God was lifting her up. And so we see that he would uh, keep her keep her spirit up, and she'd never have to uh, suffer because of the taunts of the other woman. Uh, and notice, because God, the Almighty, was her hope and salvation. <coughs> Thirdly, Sorry, we're, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if I may uh, expand a little bit in that direction, sir. Uh, uh, are we not unlike her? Have we not been favored already in this life on planet Earth? Uh, what's going to happen the rest of our day? Well, we're probably going to have a good meal, watch a sports event or two, uh, not under the threat of missiles and artillery uh, hitting our homes or as we walk out of church. God has blessed us so much already. And I don't know about you guys, but there's sometimes. I get those molly grubs and start feeling sorry for Barry. What a dumb thing to do. We have been blessed from the time I came out of my mother's womb. Well, sure, we've all had challenges, but never missed a meal. I've never lived a day I didn't have a roof over my head. And here I am sitting now on a scooter, but I've got all the conveniences of what. I've got everything I need, even though I'm on a scooter and can't walk. The message is, we're just like her. We need to recognize our blessings. No, we live in a society, oh, this is bad, this is horrible, boy, I got ripped off. <clears throat> you got to be cautious with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Barry, I think you're saying that 
with all these things that, that God has blessed you with and all of us with, but you're saying that you are blessed with God. You know, that's that's uh, huge. That's a good way of putting oh, it, Jim. absolutely, Jim, and that is in that direction. You know, I, I love what the Bible says, guys, and it's true. I'm still learning about it, but I know it's the truth. God's Word says that a man or a woman in faith will be satisfied within themselves. Why? Because they really do know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. They really do have a direct personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. And once you start entering into that one, it doesn't matter about outside of circumstances. We are blessed. But in the fundamental speaking of being blessed, on. What are you guys going to have today? Roast, fish, filet? Yeah, all these things are true because, you know, we're to make application. That's why we even study the Old Testament. You know, even though there are people who say, well, we're in New Testament, we shouldn't study Old Testament. They're wrong. We study the Old Testament because there's application we can make. We can see truths in the life of Hannah and Ruth and Samson and, and all the rest. And we're to appropriate the good things that they did and what it's talking about here now is that she worshiped God, notice, third of all, because he's holy. Verse 2. Now the word holy means he's set apart, and unique. He's pure and free from sin. Nobody can compare to him. The Lord is holy and unwavering. He's a rock, a firm place on which to stand, on whom we can depend. Now all these other uh, adverbs that uh, the Bible uses to describe God is what she is depending upon. And I like R.C. Sproul, who wrote, you know, the whole uh, series on the holiness of God. And he says, you know, the Bible says something once and it's important. It says it twice. It's very important. But there's only one thing that it says three times. And that is God is holy, holy, holy. Now, verse 6, the fourth thing Hannah praised God for was because he has the power over life and death. Now, this reality was clear to her. She had experienced the hand of God opening her womb and granting her a child. Yet what she acknowledged here was more complete. She says God not only has power over the womb, God has power over death and life. And notice she says he restores some to life now this is a picture of salvation. This goes along with what Randy said earlier about the body, the bread, and the wine. God restores life, and that is, you know, what the Bible talks about, eternal life. And God can give it to those who put their faith in Him. But then He sends some notice down to Sheol. Now this place of the unrighteous dead and we see it's a representation of eternal separation from God. And so what she is saying in her own understanding of heaven and hell back in the Old Testament, she's, she is realizing that God has the power to give eternal life and he has the power to punish those who won't put their faith in him. So in summary, Hannah prayed to God for the source of joy, number two, the source of power, number three, the source of holiness, and number four, the source of life. She prays this God as we should too. Now, let's talk about some of those things. And that's what I believe that Barry and Jim were both talking about. Notice, we know God who is the source of everlasting joy. We rejoice not because our lives are easy, and that's what Barry is saying, not because our circumstances are ideal, but because we're loved by the God of the universe who set his affections on us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's exactly what these guys were saying to us a minute ago. We have joy because God took notice of us. He remembered us. He, he put his hand upon us. He gave us the faith. 
you know, as Ephesians 2.8 says, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. And, and so we rejoice in this joy of knowing that we have salvation, and then even at the end of life, we get to go be with the Lord and our loved ones who have put their faith in Him, they're there uh, already. Notice, we know that God is a source of power. You know, He has uh, the power over sin and death, the Bible says. You know, don't, don't fear Him who can take the body and do Him no more, but fear Him who can take body and soul and cast them into hell. Only God has this power. Satan, all he can do is send a Christian to heaven if God allows it. He can't do anything more than that. All I can do if God gives him the privilege, remember Job, you know, Job says, hey, let me take away all the good things you gave to Job in his life. And God says, go ahead, but don't touch him. It didn't do any good. So he comes the next day and says, well, let me touch his body. And God says, you can touch his body, but don't take his life. Satan has no power over even life or death. He has to get permission from God before he can do anything. And so we know that God is the source of our power. But with God on our side, through faith in Christ, our horns are lifted up because Jesus has gone before us and has won our salvation. And so the Bible says we have nothing to fear. There's really nothing for a Christian to fear because we know what awaits us. And it's all good things, nothing bad. Because God doesn't see us. He sees us robed in the, the blood-soaked robe of Jesus Christ. And then notice thirdly, God's the source of our holiness. And he defines holiness as being perfect in all of his ways. And we know that through his Holy Spirit dwelling in us as believers, we are being made. We are not holy yet. We know that. But we're being made holy. And that's what sanctification is all about. And so God will make us as holy as he wants us, and then he'll take us home. You know? We get to a place where we quit growing, we quit being what he wants us to be. He says, oh, okay, time to come home. And so uh, we who are his, he takes us home. But think about this. This is not a punishment. We're talking about they go to heaven. They go to be in the presence of God and the angels and the parties. Uh, when Jesus comes back again, the dead in Christ are going to rise and they're going to meet you know, those in the air who are alive and we'll all be transformed. We'll come to Jesus' presence and after God gets away all, all the evil on the face of the earth, and the Bible says he transforms it by fire, according to Second Peter, and then he makes the entire earth a new Eden. And then he's going to set up the supper table for all of his saints, Old Testament and New Testament. And the reason we know that is because we're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Bible says, at this supper. And God will uh, himself be there with us. You know, the blessings are just so great. And then we see finally that God is a source of life. He's the only hope that fallen sinners have of eternal life. If they try to come through Muhammad or through Confucius or, or any other way, they're going to fail. And even the Israelites, if they're putting their faith of the God of the Old Testament and not in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they will fail also. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, there's no other name given us in uh, heaven and earth whereby we must believe, and that name is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm the only way. The only way you can get to God. It's like when you go to Six Flags and you gotta go through those little turnstiles that's really not even big enough for one. Kind of get in there sideways and you know, get that thing to turn so you can get in there. Well, that's how you get into heaven, only through Jesus. Just he's the turnstile. He's the only way that we're able to enter and get with God. And so we see a good analogy. Yeah, thank you. And so with him. Through faith, we see uh, that Hannah's song becomes our song. Her God is our God. And so we see that Hannah's prayer resembles other songs like we talked about, like Miriam and Mary. But we know today the people of God join in the eternal choir singing praises to God for the wonders He has done among us. 
and you know, through the circumstances, though they may be difficult, though they may be hard, our praise is the same. Thank God that He saves. Can I chase a rabbit just for a moment? Uh, yeah, let's chase a rabbit. In uh, we skipped a couple of verses, <laughs> three, four, and five, but I find it interesting. In three, uh, the the song of uh, Hannah here says begins uh, talk to him more exceedingly proudly let not arrogance come out of your mouth and then down in verse 5 she says uh, they that were full have hired themselves off for bread and they that were hungry cease so that the barren hath borne seven and she that hath many children is wax feeble and, you know I think a part of that is her uh, response to uh, Penina. yeah that uh, it's, it's almost the way in this prayer saying, shut up, because as you said earlier, you know, God's blessed me. And it almost seems like in her prayer that, that maybe she's expecting more children. I don't know if she had more children. I don't remember what the Bible says. But it almost sounds like that she's saying, you know, I'll have seven children, and, and you may have a lot of kids, but you're going to get old and feeble. You know, you're, you're not. You know, you're not you know, I mean, it's... It, it just struck me that this is really uh, kind of in your face. You know? I don't know. That's a rabbit. Uh, the rabbit's gone back and home now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody have anything you want to comment before we dispense? I just want to shout out and praise uh, to the Lord. Uh, but I want to shout out and praise to Barry Moore. Who's been a great friend to me and encouraged me to come back into the Bible study. Uh, uh, I thank God for him. Uh, he's, he's become a good buddy of mine. And uh, God bless him and be with him and work his healing powers on Mary. And uh, I know that uh, he loves the Lord. I feel that. And that has impressed me so much about him too. Thank you. Mr. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again at the end of this lesson, thanking you for the word that we have, for the uh, experiences, Lord, we can draw from this particular uh, event in the Bible. We uh, pray that we'll just take that with us during the week, Lord, meditate upon it, and let it enrich our lives. We pray for the after service, which uh, in many ways will be a very interesting one because there's some analogies that the pastor has to bring about that meet some of the things we just uh, discussed here. We pray also, God, that you would just uh, help us take his words throughout the week to feast upon them, to learn from them. All this we ask in your precious name. Amen. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Jim Barry. Make sure you take this for the show.